Well, we have of many yeah, so we'll try and pushing the wings over first. First of all, my name is Pascal Ries. Uh, I'm working at W3 Data, which is a small, small company. We just enjoyed the Scrum Talk very much because uh, we are our whole company is actually three people. So Scrum would probably end up in two people screaming at me. <laughs> um, okay, uh, we are in close collaboration with uh, Better.com like the largest German weather network. And uh, it's all about uh, building a universal push notification service. For <coughs> um, just a quick outline of my work. So what are workshop interactions? What are the detailed uh, requirements? I'm going to talk about the technologies that we use or that we try. Uh, which one we're actually using. Um, give some benchmarks and give a short outlook to the next steps, which will be main outlooks. So, what are we trying to achieve? What we want is a push notification service uh, which targets uh, web on the one hand. So, we want to have like users of, of the main website to be notified as soon as some weather warning comes in for their specific region. And we also want to have that for mobile. So we want uh, iPhone and Android devices to also receive push notifications as soon as something happens that might be of interest for the user. So given, so what, what do we actually have to use is official weather warnings from the local authorities. So in, for Germany, that's the Deutsche Wetterdienst, the um, EWD. And uh, for other countries, there's others. I'll show some in, in, on the next slide. And uh, one of the main problems is that all this information from the local authorities comes in some more or less sensible format. And most of the times, it's less sensible. So it's really hard to parse that correctly. Uh, to deal with uh, cancellations is a big issue, for example. Some of the authorities always send the complete state of how is the status of the, all of the regions at the, the specific point in time. Others do it another way, they only um, um, provide new information if something changes, and so on. So we are, you have to deal with all of that. I'm not going to talk about that this today. It's just keep in mind that this is a whole problem on its own. And um, yeah, and what we want to do is really pass on this information to millions of users, possibly, in the shortest possible amount of time. So uh, there's no use of uh, receiving a rain outlet, for example, uh, in 15 minutes. So if the processing take, takes 15 minutes, but the outlet says, okay, in 15 minutes it's going to rain. So that's too late already. So we want to have that within minutes, if possible. So just to give you a glimpse, you don't have to read, read that, of how uh, the DWD, for example, part, uh, provides their, their files that's uh, usually, luckily, now it's XML files, so, and uh, they're quite unreadable. It's, um, at least it's XML, so you, you can do something with it, but um, it's still, there's lots of stuff in it that is probably due to historical reasons or whatever, and uh, just one more page of how, how that kind of looks like for uh, a wind warning, for example. And it's amtliche warning for wind. And uh, it always gives like when does the warning take place, when, where, and when does it expire, and stuff like that. So you have to take all this into account, of course. And uh, so. As I said, it's quite complicated to actually reach the correct place where, where to find this uh, information. And uh, what is more, it's a, it's a really terrible mess. Because what is more, um, they also have like situations, one situations for a whole country, for example. And that is plain text file, so you cannot even pa uh, parse uh, properly. And you have to kind of look for the right file names and the right folders on the FTP server. It's really uh, confusing. But okay, so that's uh, the DWD. 
And we have some more providers, we have Austria, Switzerland, and Spain, and the ultimate goal is to have like all of at least Central Europe we like to have. And all of them have different formats of how, how they provide their, their big data. All of them have to provide this data. So there's, a, there's this uh, European, I don't know, law probably that they have to have some way of <coughs> to have people access this data. Um, but uh, the law doesn't say it has to be easy. So <coughs> what figures are we talking about? So what are the detailed requirements? So for the web, we usually have something like or peaks of like the 100,000 concurrent users that are surfing the site, which results in something like 2,000 requests per second. Um, mobile users, we have uh, around 1 million users for uh, iOS, and uh, I don't know how many for Android, because I haven't really looked into the Android part yet so much. And uh, so what technologies did we, do we try to use or to exploit? For the web, we decided to go for web sockets or long calling as a push notification um, technique. Uh, for mobile, we decided not to implement our own, but to use the platform provided push service, which is called APNS for, uh, for Apple and uh, GCM for Android. And um, of course, the challenge is so it's not that easy. So it's a really a lot of uh, a lot of concurrent sessions and a lot of requests per second, because in the in the initial uh, if the user serves the site initially, you always have to get the, the current one status. So you have one request no matter what, and then you then you switch into push mode and do this push notification thing. So you have to also handle all these requests. You have to deliver all of that uh, via also to the mobile users via IPNS or GCM, and all of that without trigger, triggering a denial of service attack protections. Because that's also something that, that might happen if you have this amount of users and requests, then um, your service provider where you have your servers hosted, you might just switch on the, the uh, EOS attack protection, which happened to us actually. So um, I really jumped into this from nothing. So we, we just built the whole thing, the whole system from scratch. So I was uh, doing some research of what technologies could you actually use, what would make sense to, and could get the job done. And uh, pretty quick I came to, to the name Redis, which is a key value store, but that also implements a publish sub subscribe pattern. And um, as it turns out, Redis was the right choice because it's extremely fast, it's, it's extremely reliable, it's actually it is the sole one and single component that did not have any problems throughout all, all this uh, development. So I'm, I'm uh, extremely happy with, um, with that. So we use it uh, in two different ways. We use it to store the actual one status for all of the regions at, at any given point of time, and or for the actual, for the current time, and we use it as the central publish and subscribe instance. So it's kind of like the omni-science um, instance. So Redis knows everything about all the warnings at all times. And if we want to push a message, we have to listen to Redis, and if the warning falls out of Redis, we then have to push it on to our other systems. What else do we use uh, on the backend side? It's uh, also PostGIS. It's like a Postgres extension for um, geo data, so it can handle shapes and rasters and so on. That's mainly to uh, determine what region is uh, that the users are interested in. So you, you can either you can use um, the region ID, if you know that as a user, or you can just go in with the geographic coordinates, long, longitude, latitude, and the system will find out which region it is and uh, subscribe you to the right region. And uh, moreover, we also use it uh, for the mobile users uh, to handle their subscriptions, to, to make sure that the same user gets subscribed to the same uh, channels that uh, one channels um, that 
he had selected before. For the web, um, we don't do that on this backend side, um, so weather.com handles this themselves. They don't have to deal with that. A um, few words about um, the mo mobile technologies. So we have uh, APNS and GCM. So APNS is the Apple push, uh, notification system, GCM is the Google Cloud Messaging Service. Um, current state of what we are actually using is the APNS for the iOS, uh, for the iOS app. Um, GCM, I am using that in the test on, on my device actually, but it's not in production for the main better.com app yet. And again, the challenge is you have many different notifications. It's because it's not that you have one notification and you just send it to a million of users. You have also different notifications. You have like, if you have one million users, they're all registered to different uh, regions. And then uh, you need to prepare maybe 10,000 messages or 100,000 messages and send them to the, to the users. So it's not only the same message to all of them, it's also per, per user. So uh, it's a lot of stuff that goes to the Apple servers, and we also find out that this is kind of the bottleneck for the, uh, for the uh, push notification. And our solution to, for the APNS is to keep 10 raw SSL sockets open to the Apple servers at all time. And whenever something comes in, we just push it out as fast as possible. And that works quite good, actually. So m most of the times, if there's a lot of things going on and you have like 10,000 um, messages at a time, then all of this goes through within minutes. So, so we're good here. And we get new warnings usually every five minutes, maybe. So we're on the safe side. For GCM, we need a different approach uh, because, at least for the for the last version of GCM, it was like one post request per batch of thousand receivers. Um, so I found out that the Google servers do not respond very well to a massive load. I don't know, maybe that changed. But last time I tried, they just shut down and they always send error messages. Not, not even the ones that I would expect, but simply internal server error and no further information whatsoever. Uh, so you have to really throttle your, your requests and reuse for different source IPs so that uh, the Google servers do not shut down before we have sent everything. But as I said, it's not in production anyway. So, <coughs> So the, the main talk, so what I was actually, uh, my, my main topic is actually is, uh, how about the, the web? So the, the users that, that use the browser and how do the push notification for them? So we tried two different setups. And the first version that we tried is we were using Node.js and Socket.io because I have great things about that and it should be able to handle this, uh, this kind of uh, load easily. And the second, uh, second setup that I came up with uh, quite a while later is an Nginx uh, combined with push stream module. And um, if you, uh, I don't know in how much detail I should go, I mean Node.js, most of you should have heard of, so that's the JavaScript server side server if you want to. Uh, Socket.io is an extension to Node.js or a module um, which deals with web sockets so you can actually handle push notifications or switch to other types of uh, notification if web sockets are not available for all the browsers. Um, Nginx on the other hand is a very fast uh, reverse proxy and uh, kind of really small, quick, and can handle also lots of requests. So it's for, for high-end so, uh, high uh, websites, it's uh, the first choice, I would say. And the push stream module is also able to handle web sockets and or long calling as push notifications or, or the communication between the browser and the, and the server. So now, 
What well, turned out, if we use Node.js and Socket.io, yeah, that did not work out for us at all. I mean, it was capable of handling all the requests. No problem, did it, but only for, in the beginning, it was, we didn't run it on full load, so it worked out for like a week or so. In the end, when we gave 100%, so all the users actually were hitting Node.js and using Socket.io, uh, we had a massive uh, memory leak. So I, I could not find out where that thump came from. Uh, I mean, there, there's a lot of uh, uh, open tickets on GitHub. Um, most of them are memory related, and one of them might have been that, but we couldn't find out. It was impossible to really debug that and find the, the leak. So in the end, it was so bad, we had to restart the server every day, and that's really bad. Because the memory, like the, the 16 bits or something, just filled up. So that's why we finally decided for going for Nginx. And um, yeah, in my opinion, also, that's another thing I've never heard of before. So uh, after some research, I came up with uh, an Nginx distribution called OpenResty. And that is kind of a bundle of uh, Nginx together with Lua as a script language. And, uh, and that is extremely fast. It is incredible. So you can uh, handle that kind of requests in, with no problem. The, the CPU percentage is still low. You don't have to restart every time because the memory leaks have gone apparently. And then we also we have this push stream module to do the, the actual communication from the server to the client. Um, there's only one drawback, because uh, Node.js can directly directly listen to the Redis server and can just push simply push the stuff onto the users. Nginx cannot, at least not now. I mean, something like that is planned, but it's not uh, there yet. So we have to kind of have a, a a layer in between that simply listens to Redis and pushes this on to Nginx. So this is the whole setup, like as a schematic draft. So we have the Redis as the central um, central component, and then we have two listeners: the web listener, which simply pushes stuff to the Nginx server, and the, the Nginx server finally pushes this to the to the web users. And we have the mobile listener, who whenever a warning comes in looks in, in the database which user which users are subscribed and then sends that to APNS or GTM and then finally the mobile users will receive the um, notification. Um, so one of course major is issue is what hardware do we need for all that? We don't need a cluster or anything. It's probably currently we're using only two servers one server is solely for Nginx, one server is for Redis, Postgres, and the listener scripts. Uh, we're just changing that right now to one virtual machine that will handle everything. So I'm pretty confident that that, that will work. Yeah, so it's, that's quite, quite impressive, especially if you, what, what we thought in the beginning, what we would need. So we, we kind of ordered four machines in the beginning for all but yeah, we had, had to do lots of stuff. It's not needed. Um, so once more to recap, what's the flow? The flow of action we want. So the user opens better.com, for example. In this case, um, the JavaScript, there's some JavaScript code there, holds the current state of his subscribed one region. On the Nginx side, the Lua script holds the state from Redis, delivers that as JSON, then the JavaScript does something with that, you know, displays it to the user or just keeps it in, in memory, then waits 15 seconds, I'm not sure if it's really 15 or maybe 10 or 30 or whatever, then subscribes to the push stream channel, then the protocol switching takes place in modern browsers, so you have your WebSocket connection, which is like an open connection all the time, and then the push stream module just sits there and waits for incoming messages. So, yeah, just uh, yeah, the, the, the 
mo most important part is down here. So that's just uh, in Chrome uh, what, what things are loaded. If you load up meta.com, if you have a look, then one thing that is loaded is the push thing. That is this one that's just the JavaScript, which is loaded into an iframe, I think. I don't know. This is this, but uh, mo most importantly, what, what happens at some point, if you if you just keep that window open and look, and, uh, look to that, um, it will, at some point, will show here switch protocols. And then here, it will get, um, the HTTP response code is 101, and it will switch to web sockets. And at that point, this connection here will stay open, and that's the one that will receive um, the one messages. Um, just a bunch of benchmarks. Um, so what's the typical values we have? Like Nginx requests. Uh, you can see, that's of course, per day, the, those, those up and down. But usually we have peaks, maybe 1.2k requests per second. And uh, yeah, here, peaks, maybe 80,000, 90,000 users. So that's that's the typical uh, values and the same same kind of um, benchmarks for uh, Nginx uh, for for Redis. So what's happening in Redis? Um, your most most interesting maybe how how many again how many requests per second? Because there's always some back and forth involved or to and fro from Redis. And what's the response time? And most of the time you can see the response time is really low. It's, it's well beyond uh, one. Um, second. So Redis is really great. Um, so if we start with that response time, this is to the to the other second server where Redis is running. It's response time yeah. from the application to the Redis server. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's really good. And um, just a few words to the next steps, which is actually for the website. I think it's in production already. I haven't really looked. Um, the thing is, what we also want to have is rain alerts. So you want to know if, like, in the next half an hour, the rain will be coming to your location. And uh, so the TWD provides these uh, rain radar images, and uh, we are using actually the Central Europe uh, images. That's two kilometers per kilo two kilometers per pixel, and it's updated every fifteen minutes. And based on these images, well, since I'm actually I'm not an educated developer, I'm a mathematician, so I did the uh, uh, came up with some method to compute a short-term forecast based on these radar images. How you can go like up to two hours into the future, and send push notifications if rain is coming, so with a certain certainty, of course, and in in your Area. So that's how um, these radar images look like, for example, the redder the value, the more rain is coming. Um, this is the image of whole um, of Central Europe and the dark square is roughly the area of Germany. So as you can see, there's some rain coming from below and this is now only the black square. On the left, I'm showing the forecast, so that's how, it, how the forecast looks like. To the right is what actually really, really, ha really happens. So, and afterwards, you can of course compare how good your uh, forecast was. And uh, well, all of that. So, if a user re registers for a certain area, that usually well, means he registers with one particular pixel in this image. And if something is coming, then he will receive uh, a message. So the raster is, uh, so the pixel size is uh, 460 by 460. So that means that each pixel on that image would correspond to one channel. So we have around 200,000 channels that the users can subscribe to. And typically, like 50,000 or 100,000 of them are updated if something is happening at the same time. So and that's happening all uh, every 15 minutes. So and as I said, I think this is already uh, working for the for the web front end. So, but we have a different so one machine doing only these computations. Uh, not running on the same server. So 
And uh, here's my conclusions. So push notifications for many users in almost in real time, as I said, so if we are within minutes, that's fine. It's possible even on low-end hardware, so on, on regular servers. If you use the right tool, uh, Redis is great and Unix is great. That's the take-home message for that. Thank you for listening. about the, the NGINX and Lua and um, the Redis connection because uh, this, this is uh, for, um, quite interesting because um, in our company we, are, we, we did a prototype with NGINX and Redis and the, the two worked, worked um, together quite well because Node.js is, is, is good at um, subscribing to the Redis channels but um, it looks like the um, Node.js backend is not making it into uh, production we're looking for a problem um, for Probably Java based um, solutions, so, so it's quite interesting for, for, for yeah. us. It will be quite interesting how the, the NGX work um, thing is, is talking with the Redis and can't subscribe to the um, pub sub channels. Uh, okay, yeah, that's what I said. I have I have an extra script just listening to the to the Redis okay. and then push that into the NGX. The other, I mean, the other way it does work well. I mean, you can you can simply look up a value in Redis from Nginx. So and <coughs> so the uh, the Nginx has or this open REST is called this this open, uh, Nginx distribution has uh, a Lua support and that within this Lua support there's support for Redis. Okay. So you can kind of look up values for example, you can publish messages, but you cannot receive messages mm -hmm. from from publish at least not in a in a good way, so or, or in a reproducible way. So you're essentially just polling the yes. Redis database all the time. And no, no, not all the time. I'm only polling the first time the user serves to that site. Okay. Then it's polled. Okay. So, and uh, if a push notification comes in, so I have a, a it's actually a Python G event script list <laughs> that listens to uh, to Redis and simply pushes this into Nginx. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, it's a post request or something to, to Nginx. Um, your forecast there, um, are you make, using that, are you basing that entirely on the observed rainfall? Yes. Right, so you're not using any output from any meteorological models? No, not at all. I mean, we, we, well, I am thinking about that a lot. So okay. how to how to really improve that? It is already quite good. So because they, they have like a, Quality measurement, which is called ETS, and you can compute how good your forecast is. And my forecast is usually at the ETS around 0 0.4, 0 0.5. And climate experts say, oh, well, ETS of 0.3 is still is acceptable. So I'm about that. So I'm usually I say I'm good. Think it's good. Think an ETS is better. Or? Yeah, exactly. So I say yeah, but you always can can improve. Because you can can think of uh, including like the, the the elevation data, for example. Yeah, so like where are mountains and where are clouds likely to go and st stuff yeah. like that. Or we, uh, I prepared already including like measurements of wind direction and wind speed. Yeah, there are a number of open source weather models available now. Actually, but I'm a paraglider pilot, so I care about very detailed forecasts in the short term. So I'll have a large to talk to you afterwards. So I think it'd be quite interesting. Any more questions?